Please go ahead. All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, I'm excited to introduce our plenary speaker this afternoon, Dr. Wynn Norton, who's a program director in implementation science in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences at the National Cancer Institute. Her research interests include de-implementation of ineffective interventions, the topic of her talk this afternoon, uh, evidence-based cancer care delivery and pragmatic trials of implementation strategies. She received her PhD in social psychology from the University of Connecticut in 2009 and was a fellow in the inaugural class 2010 of the Implementation Research Institute or IRI. She serves on the editorial board of the journal Implementation Science. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Norton to give us her talk today. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with all of you today. Um, again, my name is Wynne Norton. I'm a program director here at the NCI. Um, and I'll spend uh, approximately the next 30 minutes or so um, speaking with you about de-implementation. There we go. Um, <clears throat> within the context of healthcare and public health, really trying to highlight some very high level um, current approaches to what we know from the research, as well as some future directions and some resources for supporting research and advancing this area of inquiry. Before I begin, just to note that I have no financial relationships to disclose, and the opinions expressed herein are mine, not official positions of the NCI, the NIH, or the US federal government. So three kind of buckets here that I'd like to go over. Um, first, highlighting and really trying to discuss and better understand what do we mean by de-implementation? Why is it important? What are we actually talking about? And why should we be focusing on this from a research and a practice perspective? Um, next, go into so what, are some, what are some of the key concepts in de-implementation or key components, at least from we know from the literature and from practice um, opportunities and practice activities so far. And then what are some ways in which we can advance research on de-implementation, as well as some practice um, practical tools for supporting de-implementation. So why de-implementation? Why is this something that is needed in the field that we should focus on in both healthcare um, settings and public health settings? There's really been a, a couple of different issues that have coalesced here over the past 10 to 15 um, years, uh, really trying to focus more on overuse and the recognition that we are seeing a lot more over screening, over diagnosis and over treatment. Um, and this overuse, underuse, misuse classification was first introduced in 1998. So this is not necessarily quote unquote new um, per se, but it's really following up on some of the discrepancies in the quality of care that we've seen and have been documented over time. And we see that increasing over time, unfortunately. We see um, an increase in recognition and identification of low value care, which is similar, really trying to emphasize little to no benefit, potential harm and unnecessary cost. And taken together, there was a review done, um, estimates done by 2019, which is the follow up from previous review um, that really identified the cost or estimated the cost of over treatment or low value care in the United States. Um, one type of the six classifications of waste. Um, approximately 75 to 101 billion dollars. I'm sure um, we could probably all agree that uh, considering that is wasteful, um, our limited resources might be better spent elsewhere, including but not so, uh, including but not limited to delivering evidence-based care. Um, another aspect of waste was identification of administrative procedures, which is also a target of de-implementation. But for purposes of this talk, I'll be um, focusing specifically on practices in healthcare and public health settings. There's been an increase in the identification, documentation, um, and empirical work on medical reversals. And um, initially it was approximately 156 and has increased to 396 um, by Herrera and Perez a couple years ago, where they looked at the top three medical journals. And this is essentially a situation where we initially had evidence that some type of practice program drug treatment guideline, we'll use the collectively as intervention, um, worked uh, from some type of trial, some type of study, where we subsequently find actually through um, larger uh, powered trials, randomized controlled trials, that actually it, this intervention does not work and potentially is more harmful than helpful. And so this is kind of the flip-flop type of literature that we've seen increasing. 
And then finally, um, which I think is inevitable, um, that evidence is dynamic. And we see a lot of uh, appreciation for that and recognition of that in implementation science, including some recent articles um, by Rachel Shelton and colleagues focusing on kind of the dynamism of evidence. David Chambers has talked about this as well, and really the need to accept that and recognize that and anticipate adjusting for that, whether that's adaptation, um, whether that's uh, substitution of a different intervention or a more cost-effective intervention, and trying to think about some of those issues as we generate more better evidence um, at, through the use of better statistical models, stronger and more methodologically sound um, research designs and study methods, qualitative, quantitative, mixed methods, as well as really trying to expand partnerships and participation and representation of individuals, communities, and systems that participate in research and to which the results would be applicable. So what are we actually talking about, this kind of de-implementation term? And I'm using it, of course, as a catch-all um, for purposes of this talk, just uh, to make it a little more efficient. Um, but we have seen, uh, there was a study by Niven and colleagues done in 2015, and you'll see that it echoes um, the implementation science literature, which uh, McKibben and colleagues found in 2010, approximately 100 different terms talking about this space of implementation science. And certainly we see kind of a, a similar um, phenomena here, um, looking at the additional terms, and these are sized here in terms of frequency. So at the time, disinvestment, decrease, discontinuation. Um, and while we appreciate and recognize the need for different terms and the need for different definitions, um, I think it's also important to be very clear what one means when one's talking about this type of um, field or this type of uh, phenomena. So the, one of the definitions that we have used and, and try to use and be clear about um, is that de-implementation is really the study of how to reduce or stop the use of an ineffective health service or practice. Um, really focusing on the how, similar to implementation science, focusing in on the type of behavior, reduce or stop, although I'll expand on that in just a minute, um, as well as being very explicit that this is some type of, of intervention that is being delivered to individuals, whether in healthcare or public health settings, by some type of practitioner or collection of practitioners, again, in different settings, through a particular delivery system. So there's a clear kind of chain of um, actions that take place there and who's involved in delivering or receiving um, and implications, of course, for studying that broadly speaking. So I just wanna to touch upon some similarities um, based on the, uh, this is certainly not comprehensive and it's not empirically based, um, but based on a uh, review of the literature and discussion um, with experts, we can see, I think, a lot of overlap here um, between implementation science and de-implementation science or uh, research. Um, I think at least from, from what we've seen, there are these broad aspects that really are the fundamental underlying components of both of these fields. fields. Um, context is critically important. Partnerships are critically important um, with end users for generating ideas, partnership-driven or provider-driven research engagement um, in a meaningful way all the way through the entire study design um, formulation of those research questions through the sharing and dissemination of the results of the study or studies. It's really multidisciplinary. Um, we have fields, uh, health services research, uh, clinical trials, psychology, sociology, anthropology, um, statistical experts, really see diverse multidisciplinary components of these teams that are being pulled together, reflecting the diversity of the types of questions and contexts in which de-implementation occurs. We know and, and emphasize and appreciate the health equity focus that needs to be increasingly incorporated both into implementation and de-implementation, recognizing, for example, that Blacks and Hispanics are more likely to receive low value care in the US um, compared to whites. We see similar research methods and study designs, um, so quasi-experimental designs such as your interrupted time series, trials such as your randomized controlled trials, your pragmatic trials, your stepped wedge cluster trials, mixed methods design, um, incorporation of qualitative and quantitative and integration of those. We see theories, models, and frameworks increasingly being used. 
similar to implementation science, some of these have been taken from other disciplines and applied to, -implement, uh, to implementation, whereas others have been generated um, initially, sorry, I have my coworkers uh, not listening to um, what she's supposed to be doing. That's my dog, apologies. The joys of working from home. Um, there is models and frameworks. Um, we see some that are being developed specifically for de-implementation, some that are, have been developed for implementation, applied to de-implementation. I'll go over some of those. Really multi-level, multi-faceted aspects, and then your barriers and facilitators and your strategies. So again, those are kind of the underlying components and similarities and foundational aspects. Where we start to see some divergence um, between implementation and de-implementation are in some of these aspects, again, including but not exclude, uh, including but not limited to. So the starting point, and by that I mean that in de-implementation, there is something currently being used, some type of ineffective or, or inappropriate intervention or practice. That's the starting point um, versus an implementation where it's often the case where nothing is being used or it's being used very little. And so kind of some of the implications of that in terms of what the behaviors are, how that practice got into the care setting, and what can be done um, based on that sequence. Uh, we further focus on differentiating between type of action or behavior, um, not just on the patient or the provider level, but certainly organizational behavior change as well, to the extent that the implementation focuses more on decreasing or stopping some type of behavior, provision of some type of intervention, versus impl implementation, which often focuses more on increasing or starting or initiating some type um, of intervention and delivering it. We see a little more emphasis in de-implementation on emotions, on learning, on habits and cognitive processes. A lot of this borrowing from literature that has been well established for decades in social psychology and cognitive psychology. The work by Wendy Wood, for example, who's looked at habits and strategies or interventions for breaking habits. Christian Helfrich, who's giving a presentation next, talking about adapting dual process cognitive models for de-implementation and others. A focus on the level, quality, or type of evidence. There are obviously discussions in implementation science around how much evidence is necessary to warrant or justify implementation. And similarly here, although a little more nuanced, we talk about the quality and quantity of evidence um, again, uh, for the de-implementation of a practice and how that interacts with the decision um, to identify that practice, the decision to de-implement that practice or change the delivery of that particular practice, and importantly, what types of strategies might be needed depending on the level or type of evidence. And then finally, this interplay between past, present, and future. And this is kind of a broader perspective of um, taking into account what are the implications of de-implementation for short and long-term impact on public and patient trust in health research and the biomedical healthcare system. And how does that come into play um, in terms of what has been delivered in the past and is currently being delivered and how do you de-implement that in a way that really minimizes the potential for distrust or lack of trust within the public healthcare and medical research delivery systems. So what are some key concepts in de-implementation? De as I mentioned, there are frameworks and models in a review by Walsh Bailey and colleagues recently identified 27 unique um, frameworks and models focused specifically on de-implementation, kind of classifying it into these different categories based on the Nielsen and colleagues at Nielsen review. Um, and I just wanna go over a couple examples here of the 27, again, applied to de-implementation. Some have been pulled from other scientific di disciplines and applied to this context. Some have been adapted from implementation science. Um, and in the next session, I believe Dr. Helfrich will be talking about its dual process model for unlearning and substitution, drawing on some of the cognitive psychology literature. And Dr. Dossett will be talking about a phased framework and surgery that she and her colleagues developed. So there's a little teaser for that. One example that was published recently by Jeremy Grimshaw, um, focused on the choosing wisely de-implementation framework. And so choosing wisely, which is an international uh, campaign to try and reduce the use of low value care. And you can see some of the, the uh, similarities here with other implementation 
models in terms of recognizing the complexity of this issue, recognizing that this is something that's a phased approach um, and not kind of a one and done. We see a similar phased approach here for describing low value care to implementation phases and action steps, which was published recently. Um, again, kind of the plan, identify, de-implement, and evaluate. And a, a framework that my colleagues David Chambers and Barry Kramer and I published a couple years ago, really trying to articulate some of these aspects that I mentioned and pull apart these different factors and how they might relate to actual de-implementation. One of those issues that we articulate is um, the strength of evidence of an intervention. Again, practice program, drug treatment guideline, whatever it might be in that particular delivery setting. And so we tried to tease apart these four different aspects of quality or level of evidence for an intervention, recognizing that there's some empirical work um, reflecting not only the selection or appropriate selection of interventions that should be de-implemented, but also strategies and how to do that. So ineffective interventions are empirical evidence that the intervention does not work. We have very strong, rigorous evidence that this should not be done anymore. Um, so how do, we how do we take that out of the system? How do we stop doing that? Contradicted, which is similar to kind of your medical reversal here, where we have more recent higher quality empirical evidence that indicates that this actually doesn't work um, compared to what we thought previously worked, which is why we implemented it. Mixed, so kind of an equal amount and quality of um, evidence, whether it be uh, quantitative and or qualitative, that this intervention or practice or program does work or it doesn't work. So kind of this gray area, so to speak, and then untested, which some folks refer to as aspirational interventions where we think it works, we have, we have intuition that it works, um, but we don't have any empirical evidence that it actually does. Another aspect that we kind of pulled apart a little bit um, is types of actions for de-implementation. Again, are we stopping something entirely and taking it out of the delivery system? Are we replacing it? Um, so instead of delivering one intervention, let's say we identify one that is more cost-effective or has a greater effect size that's targeting a similar type of health outcome or collection of outcomes. How do we stop that intervention and replace it with something new or substitute it with something new? We could reduce the frequency and or intensity of the intervention. Um, let's say having a, a screening test done every five years instead of every three or changing dosage from 100 milligrams to 50 milligrams. And finally, restriction. And so the use of intervention with narrow scope. So rather than universal testing for populations, we have it um, changed to high risk populations testing only. Multi-level determinants of de-implementation, again, just as we see with implementation, um, some overlap here in kind of conceptualizing this. There are certainly other um, models out there that, that call attention to the different types of levels. Um, but broadly speaking, I think you can see here overlapping with EPIS and CIFR, some of those inner context, outer context, inner setting, outer setting, patient provider level aspects, and how this um, plays a role, again, in either facilitating or impeding de-implementation. So patient level barriers, um, again, some in implementation, but we'll highlight those here that are really more focused on de-implementation based on um, kind of the literature and, and emerging data that we have. So inaccurate cognitions or beliefs that, you know, more care is better care. And if a provider isn't, isn't giving me care or, or administering some test or uh, treatment, then it's really rationing care and, and it's unnecessary and inappropriate. Negative emotions, so anxiety over not knowing, you know, I'd rather know than know even if that test isn't very accurate. And of course, a consistent um, and unfortunate distrust of medical establishment based on um, historical issues and unfortunately current issues as well. One example, um, looking at these patient level aspects is a study by Rachel Shelton and colleagues um, who I believe spoke earlier today trying to better understand what are some of the factors um, and how, uh, how individuals perceive changes in guidelines um, with a particular focus on de-implementation. And so really, again, calling attention here to um, individuals' perceptions of mistrust of guidelines, confusion about why they are no longer receiving some type of screening um, for cancer when they were receiving it in the past, 
um, and concerned that uh, the guidelines don't reflect, reflect their lived experiences um, and really trying to emphasize that it's an empowerment tool and to the extent that one reduces or changes the use of that, it may have an, an effect in a negative way on engaging in other health behaviors. Provider level barriers here, we're talking about kind of negative past experience or cognitive dissonance, fear of medical malpractice and defensive medicine. Um, negative past experience, for example, could be an incident where a provider appropriately did not issue or did not order a test or provide some treatment, but it led to a catastrophic um, outcome for uh, the patient. Um, and so to the extent that they would like to uh, prevent the probability of that happening in the future. Perhaps it's something where, you know, I'm going to be rather be safe than sorry, and I'm going to order that test, even though it's not clinically indicated per se. Cognitive dissonance, we're pulling back uh, to 1957 when um, Fessinger first proposed cognitive dissonance in social psychology. I'm really trying to focus on how does that affect the provider in decision making in that they've provided an, an intervention in the past and now they're being asked either not to do it or to reduce the use. So how do they reduce the dissonance between um, those uh, changes or, or discrepancies in attitudes and actual behavior? And then fear of medical malpractice or defensive medicine, which we have some empirical evidence recently that shows that providers behave differently and are more likely to overuse low value care um, in situations where they are uh, uh, available to or um, likely to be uh, potentially um, sued, uh, but certainly it doesn't account for as much variability in the actual behavior as we had previously thought. One example here, I'll let you uh, read this quote just as a side note, this is one of uh, the most interesting titles of an article <laughs> I've ever read, don't just do something, stand there. Um, really focuses on this uh, provider's individual experience and I think calls and uh, highlights kind of the issues here of litigation, um, performance measures, and really incentives to try and provide um, more care than less care, even in situations where it's inappropriate, and the impact of patients' expectations on the provision of such care. Setting level barriers, kind of talking about the organizational setting, whether that be a hospital, a clinic, a community-based organization, a state health department, any type of context in which um, some type of intervention is being delivered when it shouldn't be. Um, talking about these, these are particularly um, more prevalent or more uh, applicable to healthcare delivery settings than public health settings. Um, and that's mostly a function of the fact that we have more evidence and more research in healthcare settings versus public health settings, although there certainly is an increasing amount in public health. Um, and I'd refer you to uh, work by Ginger McKay and Ross Brownson and colleagues who have done some really nice work looking at that within the public health settings, um, particularly HIV interventions. Within healthcare, we're focused on some of the barriers toward de-implementation. You know, there aren't other revenue generating alternatives. Um, one way in which they have competitive advantage over the market is that they offer an innovative new treatment per se, even though it doesn't have as much evidence or any evidence that it works. And a defensive organizational culture and culture and climate certainly play a role in implementation as we know, um, of course. An example here that was published um, this year uh, was a study looking at factors associated with overuse of healthcare within the US health systems. Um, so this was a really nice study looking at um, 17 low value services. They created an overuse index and looked at almost 4,000 hospitals and clinics across 676 health systems. And they were trying to identify what are some of the factors associated with the provision of low value care delivery as a way, again, to try and identify what are some of those drivers what are some of those um, levers that could be pulled and changed to try and facilitate de-implementation? And these are some of the factors that they found to be um, more likely to be associated with a delivery of low value care. Um, and so certainly would be targets for de-implementation strategies in the future, although uh, conducting some qualitative or mixed methods research, I think would be particularly important here to better understand why these certain factors are associated with 
uh, low value care. And last but not least, societal level barriers. Again, these are aspects um, that are pretty broad, that are very difficult uh, to manipulate, so to speak, if you're doing some type of trial to test the implementation strategies. But nonetheless, we know um, empirically have a very important effect on facilitating or uh, impeding de-implementation. A recent study here um, really looked at you know, the Choosing Wisely recommendations, which is an international educational campaign of approximately 20 countries um, over the past 10 years or so, and trying to assess to what extent these societal level changes, such as a, an educational campaign, Choosing Wisely, and policy level reimbursement changes, to what extent did that have an effect on reduction in low value lab tests? And so they conducted this interrupted time series uh, study, three healthcare delivery jurisdictions, including in Canada, the VA and private um, health insurance in the US with approximately 55 million patients. And they found that while the choosing wisely recommendations were associated with um, a reduction in the two low valued lab tests, it really was the combination of the, of the choosing wisely campaign and the change in reimbursement um, that led to the greatest effect. And so we have evidence here um, that really kind of pulling those levers of change and, and uh, not reimbursing for things that should not be done or should be done very infrequently has a desired effect. So de-implementation strategies, um, which we kind of conceptualize similar to implementation strategies as approaches to drive or support de-implementation really trying to better uncover what strategies are effective um, and not just what is effective, but kind of leapfrogging where we were in implementation science toward better understanding, not just what's effective, but in what context is this strategy or collection of strategies effective and how do they inevitably vary by the type of intervention, let's say a drug versus a guideline versus a multi-component um, behavior change uh, intervention, versus um, you know, uh, other types of drugs. Um, how might that vary the collection of those strategies? How might it vary by the type of action? What strategies are needed, let's say, to break habits that Wendy Wood has done a lot of research on versus reducing the frequency or intensity with which something is being delivered? And then, of course, the multi-level barriers and how those strategies may impact um, and may be needed depending on what barriers are present or absent and how those barriers importantly change over time and how we can track and deliver different strategies based on variations in the barriers over time across levels, within levels and uh, otherwise changes that occur due to policy um, outside the context of that study. A couple examples here um, we propose and there's some evidence in the literature, kind of these societal level changes around uh, social norms, these campaigns like choosing wisely, uh, generating alternative sources of revenue for a particular healthcare system. Let's say they uh, replace some type of low value care intervention with something that has more, um, is more revenue generating, um, but has uh, stronger evidence for its actual use and impact on health outcomes. Fear of medical malpractice and legis legislative tort reform and inaccurate beliefs um, such as patient education. So again, really mapping this, the strategies um, to focus on mitigating or reducing the impact of the barriers on the de-implementation process. This is another um, mapping the drivers of overdiagnosis. Um, really trying to focus here on these multi-level issues. Again, you'll see kind of the complexity here. Um, An overdiagnosis is, is similar, but a little bit different in terms of how it has come about and what one should be or could be doing to address it. But I think a lot of the aspects here are similar um, in terms of de-implementation. You see kind of possible drivers here and possible solutions. De-implementation outcomes. So trying to focus on, in addition to um, what, what folks uh, in 2020 proposed, kind of a, a reflection of implementation outcomes, but apply to de-implementation. So to some extent, the reverse of those outcomes um, by Proctor and colleagues uh, from the seminal uh, framework that they published. Um, 
and then trying to expand on that a little bit. So mapping the outcomes to the type of behavior or action, I'm making sure those are consistent. Um, so removing something, um, replacing, reducing, or restricting as appropriate based on what those outcome targets are. I think of focus and again, kind of leapfrogging, leapfrogging where we are currently with implementation science and trying to leverage that and apply it to de-implementation. So we don't have to go through kind of that process and we can take lessons learned from one field to another. What are there different strategies um, that can affect time to de-implementation? So kind of like a survival analysis, um, for example, how quickly do certain strategies um, produce the desired de-implementation outcome? And what are some of those differences that may be present um, in terms of cost effectiveness of those strategies relative to how quickly they're able to achieve those de-implementation outcomes? Are the multi-level barriers attenuated by the multi-level strategies in terms of proximal outcomes rather than distal outcomes? If you're not able to, for various reasons, look at changes in health status among patients, can you see changes in those multi-level barriers toward de-implementation over time as a proxy for effectiveness of those strategies? And then finally, unintended consequences. And this um, plays into a little bit of what I talked about earlier in terms of uh, longer term effects, um, including but not limited to the public's trust in the medical system and health research. Um, from a broad public perspective, as well as from an individual perspective of a patient who, let's say, um, decided where they don't receive screening as frequently as before, and that's really the only reason they go into their primary care to see their provider. Um, and, and unfortunately, that has a negative um, consequence of them not receiving additional care that they should be receiving um, because they're not going into the clinical care setting as often. So um, essentially trying to address the low value care delivery of an uh, uh, intervention that should be de-implemented when it unfortunately exacerbates um, the issue even more. Another unintended negative consequence could be um, kind of the, the downstream effects of a provider uh, de-implementing a particular practice that should be de-implemented, uh, but trying to compensate for it um, by ordering more tests down the road or by um, looking for other potential issues that aren't necessarily indicated, but as a way to either reduce cognitive dissonance or as a way to mitigate the potential for um, uh, loss uh, litigation. So in sum, um, we've tried to kind of pull apart some of the nuances of de-implementation. And again, this is really leveraging um, all of the great work that has been done over the past decade or two in implementation science. And how can we take what we know now and apply it already to de-implementation and kind of try to tease that apart in ways that um, might help us be more specific about de-implementation and get to a stronger and larger evidence base in de-implementation sooner. Recognizing that the multi-level complexity and interdisciplinary aspects of de-implementation, again, similar to implementation, um, the need to develop and test strategies for driving de-implementation and achieving those outcomes, and how to do that through some opportunities for supporting de-implementation research and practice. Of course, there are funding opportunities. Um, one that was recently reissued, which we're very excited to have 20 NIH Institute centers and offices having signed on for the R01, R21, and R0, uh, R01, R03, excuse me, um, which makes it very explicit um, that we're interested and in, institutes are interested in seeing applications come in that are focusing on de-implementation of these different types of interventions. There's an annual conference um, that is currently accepting abstracts. It'll be in person, um, at least as anticipated, uh, pending any, uh, hopefully no major issues around that um, in the foreseeable future, but it will be in person for the first time in two years. Very excited about that. Um, so I encourage you to submit um, abstracts on the implementation if you have uh, work being done in that space um, or certainly attend to learn more. I'm, so, I'm uh, certain there will be some tracks and presentations on de-implementation.
This is just a collection of some textbooks that have at least one, if not several chapters in them on de-implementation or de-adoption in different types of settings. And with that, I will close. Thank you very much for your time and again, the opportunity uh, to present today. And I'm happy to take questions and comments um, and feel free to email me if you have uh, additional um, questions after this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Norton. Very nicely done. Do we have any questions? So we, we have a, a comment that you maybe can reflect upon. Um, Amy Hoopsman asks, I wonder if payment policy changes are a bit more common sense for payers to implement when it is clear that a lab test is low value. It seems to be a right pocket win as opposed as compared to the wrong pocket problem we often see when trying to implement changes that benefit someone other than those paying for it. Can you comment on that? It's a great question. I think it's an empirical question. Um, and certainly one way in which we could look at this or in at least in the US is changes in the USPSTF um, ratings, United States Preventive Services Task Force. Um, so going from, let's say, something that's recommended to is no longer recommended or should be offered less often or less frequently, um, and trying to track and see if um, some of those changes occur by uh, those uh, changes in the ratings, as well as you know, who, is being, who is responsible for making that payment um, and who really has more of a, of a, is more involved and would benefit or not benefit um, in this situation from the revenue by uh, low value care. A great question. Look forward to um, a study examining just that. Um, here's another one. Would you consider patient trust to be a societal barrier as well as an individual patient barrier? And do you have thoughts on how to understand and address patient trust in de-implementation? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think it depends at the level of which it's being measured. Um, so if it's an individual uh, patient, it'd be patient level. If you're gonna aggregate it at the societal level, um, then it would be a societal level uh, uh, construct. Um, Understanding and addressing patient trust and de-implementation. I would encourage more um, qualitative studies and quantitative studies to better understand that lived experience with particular focus on um, health equity issues and um, recognizing some of the historical aspects um, and current uh, aspects that may affect um, you know, distrust in the medical system. And I think you know, to some extent, if we're effective in de-implementation, we want to make sure those longer term outcomes, we aren't um, inadvertently leaving people out from receiving healthcare and public health services that they should be receiving. Um, so making sure there aren't those downstream effects, even though we're trying to optimize the delivery of care in the current um, setting and in the present tense uh, relative to what could become a problem down the road. And you know, from a patient trust perspective, if, uh, I think it's rather unsatisfying to go to the doctor and be told there's nothing that can be done. You know, you need rest. <laughs> uh, and 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 so, if we're de-implementing some sort of action that we might have otherwise recommended, for which we don't have a replacement, that I you know that could be you know, a severe disincentive for health systems who are very reliant upon patient satisfaction scores. And, and so there's, you know, it, the value of something maybe along the lines of uh, people have a, a, a bias towards doing something or a bias towards action. Um, and if it's not harmful, at least, maybe it's low value from a monetary perspective, is it, is it still worth doing or, or what do we replace it with without hurting patient satisfaction? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great point. Um, and, and we have at least some of the uh, reviews currently show that patient engagement and particularly 
clinical uh, shared decision making is really helpful in those contexts, either where it's unclear if they if a patient should still receive this screening um, test, for example, or it's a situation where they should not be receiving this and how to explain that to patients. Um, you know, on one hand, it could be something where, okay, good, I don't have to come to the physician every every five years, only have to come in to see the specialist every three years. On the other hand, it could be, well, why have you been providing me something that I shouldn't be receiving and I have to do co-pays for over the past five years? Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's a very complex issue. Um, and I think there's a lot of work to be done around it. Right. Um, and... Oh. Along the same lines, Russ asks, do you have any advice for how to work with multiple multi-sector partners when they have different priorities, conflicting interests around the implementation, um, as we were just discussing, uh, different interests that are actually in conflict with the evidence potentially? Any advice about that? <laughs> Um, I don't know that I have any wisdom to share on that. I, Russ, I suspect you have far more wisdom than I do. Actually, I, I would, uh, I, I can't place money on any butts. However, um, but it's a great question. I think, I think the incentives for collaboration would need to be there or stronger. I think framing it as optimizing care um, versus losing revenue or helping um, systems identify alternative revenue generating uh, practices as a way to try and mitigate some hesitation around that. Um, the conflicting interest around the implementation, I think, is something to pay a particular attention to with respect to accuracy of responses and the quality of data that one um, collects. So making sure or recognizing that there are probably um, some conflicts of interest in particular situations and how do you collect and frame data collection as a way where it's okay for folks to be able to say that um, so you have an accurate representation of that context versus, um, you know, uh, asking those questions in a way that you're going to get demand characteristics and not a reflection of, of the truth per se. But certainly, um, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Russ. <laughs> Uh, I mean, when I'm thinking about our uh, opening keynote yesterday from Dr. Luke, and he's talking about culture change around what types of impacts do we value? And I, I think this is very much related to that. You know, if we have a culture of, you know, evidence-based practice, if we have a culture of, we're not going to do things that are low value, even if they make a lot of money in the health system, and that that's not you know, we're gonna sit down and talk about it, it's, that's, that's a sort of slow change and adjustment in culture. And we had a, a seminar series this year around learning health systems. I think that's also part of it. What's the culture that we're bringing uh, and how we're making decisions about how we provide care. Um, and who's at that table to make those decisions, mm -hmm. importantly, and, and I think representative of, of everyone involved. And then Claudia has a, a related point around culture and context and health equity that perhaps there's a balance or a tipping point between de-implementation or framing of de-implementation versus adaptation. And there might be instances in which it might be more palatable for a health system to, to adapt. Um, do you have any thoughts upon on that balance or tipping point? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the dynamism and, and adaptation literature has focused on, again, recognizing that evidence changes over time and the need to adapt as things change. Um, I don't, I don't know if there's a tipping point per se, and I don't know, you know, maybe it's a, it's a significant change in how the intervention is delivered. Um, maybe it's a significant change in how many components um, are being uh, need to be delivered as part of that intervention? Um, you know, I, I I don't think adaptation um, in terms of fitting to the context would be an example of de-implementation. I think it might be something that is across the board 
regardless of context, something needs to change. And so there's some um, similarity there, although again, whatever is being, um, what's being replaced in that situation should also be tailored to the context. That is very complicated and convoluted response, but I hope, um, you know, I, I, again, I think it's a great question. It, it could be kind of your PDSA type of cycles um, with swapping something out um, and putting something uh, new in and then kind of the iterati iterations on how to fit it within that context. Um, yes. Um, thanks for your talk, Wynne. I just got a question. Um, whilst obviously de implementation is highly contextual, in your particular context, can you give us a sense of any examples of how long this could take? Is there a case study of how long de implementation and how much it might cost? Yeah, it's a it's a great point. Um, I think we know from the, some of the medical reversal literature that we can predict time to medical reversal. So time from when that initial study comes out, which is gonna be, if it's an RCT, which a lot of the medical reversal has looked at because they've looked mostly at drugs um, or, or a lot at drugs. It's really that initial publication which has um, a bias toward a larger effect size versus um, smaller effect size as additional and larger studies are done. So I, I think, there is some evidence that we can predict when it's going to happen, whether or not we can anticipate that and adjust accordingly, I think is another question. Um, the cost, the cost is, you know, cost of different types of strategies, time um, to achieve, achieving those outcomes based on the different strategies and the interaction there. Um, but I also think it kind of speaks to this broader issue that you're tapping into around how do we prevent or minimize the need for de-implementation in the first place? Um, some of that is, again, we're always going to be generating more evidence and ideally better evidence, so it's inevitable. The other side of that, I think, relates to implementation and the conversations around how much evidence is necessary to warrant and justify implementation, and that's kind of an open question um, and different types of evidence that, that are more or less applicable and, and um, kind of appreciated by different groups. I guess my thought on that and, and kind of opinions expressed here in our mind um, is that I think a question we need to ask ourselves, um, you know, not, not just what's the cost of, um, you know, we want to do something, but what's the potential long-term cost of doing that? Um, so, so what are the ramifications potentially of implementing something that we don't really know if it works? Um, and, and it might be the case that it's better to not do something than do something for which we don't know if it works based on those longer term outcomes, the potential ramifications of doing so. That's not to say that everything has to be, you know, you need 10 RCTs of some particular practice to warrant justification. But it is to say that I think we need to take um, a, a pay a little more attention to the potential for um, negative repercussions if we implement something for which we don't have good evidence or we don't have strong enough evidence for for patient outcomes, but as well as for our partnerships. Um, you know, because we work with partners and, and say we have this evidence-based practice or you worked with us to generate it and now we want to spread it to different regions or states. If that doesn't work, what's the potential impact of that on likelihood of partners wanting to do research in, in the future? Um, so I, I guess that's a long way of saying it's something exactly. to consider. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Norton. Um, we have one more session to go in CopperCon today. And so we will um, we'll end this session. And then we have two more presentations coming up this afternoon. You have a choice. Both are around the implementation. If you stay in this room, it will be Dr. Christian Hilford talking about the implementation equity and outcomes. Uh, and then in our other room, room two, or the room across the hall, uh, we will have uh, Leslie Dossett talking about case examples and de-implementation. Um, so then we hope you come back tomorrow uh, for our opening keynote is from Dr. Rachel Shelton talking about sustainability and equity. 
that is sure to be a really excellent presentation. So we do hope you come back. Um, so if you would like to stop recording, Mike, I think we can get ready for our next session.